My name is Pastor Don Kudos from Victory Faith Center in Modesto, California. <laughs> Amen. And so we've been uh, going along the line of the power of God's words. Now we're on the value of God's word. And uh, the last lesson that we did was God's word endures forever. And so while other things are decaying and coming apart and all this and that, God's Word, you can depend on it. It will always be there. And God will always stand behind His Word. Mm -hmm. God does not lie. He does not go back on His Word. His Word does not return void, the Bible says. And so you can trust His Word. It's forever. Mm -hmm. Amen. And so today we want to talk about uh, the value of God's Word in the sense that it provides detailed instruction. It provides detailed yeah. instruction. And I want to take you over to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. And Paul, you know, had Timothy, his one of, well, his two main ministers were Timothy and Titus that he had written letters to that were uh, pastors that he had left and they pastored fairly large churches <laughs> in those days I guess they were very large you know some say that uh, some of the churches were up to 20,000 and more in Jerusalem they were larger so the churches today that we see you know that are 5,000 and 10,000 and so forth, you know, they haven't exceeded what happened in the beginning. <laughs> and so, uh, Paul was writing letters constantly to these guys and helping them, and we call them uh, pastoral letters. In other words, they're for people that uh, are in the area of leadership. And so, here in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, Paul's writing to Timothy and he said, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Well, uh, the law was given by Moses. Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And so grace basically in uh, one definition of grace, there's ministers that are writing a lot on grace today because of some of the things that's been said. But one of the definitions of grace is it is God's divine influence upon us to help us to receive Christ and then in us to help us to retain the things of the Lord and then flowing through us to help us to minister to other people. So those three uh, functions of grace can flow in every believer. They'll be upon you for you, uh, you know, <clears throat> to maintain you and in you to help you and flowing through you to help other people. So he's saying be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, meaning that you and I, when we're born again, we're in Christ. We're new creatures in Christ Jesus, right? And verse 2 says, And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. So Paul's telling Timothy that, you know, he's been out there ministering and uh, taking care of the churches that the Apostle Paul started, and now he's uh, having Timothy to uh, locate people that are able, faithful men, that are able to teach others to take care of other uh, smaller churches, maybe that are in the country or and other areas around there. You know, they have, today they have uh, national level, they have, uh, uh, what do they call it, uh, regional level, then they have district level, and then they have local level, <laughs> you know. And so I've m met a lot of different ministers, and some of them have risen up to, uh, say, the regional level, the ones that I've met, you know. And... The, that they're taking responsibility over ministers. They go and, and communicate with the young ministers. They have special meetings for them to help them to understand things. So when Paul would come to town, he would do things like that, you know. He would call the people together. 
Now in verse 3 it says, Therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And so he's telling him that you have to endure and when you have hard situations in your life, you have to endure those things and do it like a good soldier of Jesus Christ. We are basically a lot like military people. We have to be very disciplined mm -hmm. to stay in the Word. We have to be disciplined in prayer. And we have to be disciplined to witness to people. Amen? Mm -hmm. Verse 4, it says, No man that warreth entangle himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. So God's the one that chooses, and we're the ones that uh, obey the commands. And of course, all of the stuff is written. This is our manual. The Bible is our manual. You know, in the military, you have a manual. And one of the things that uh, I learned in the Marine Corps, because I was in different, uh, well, I had to learn different weapons because I worked with different uh, areas in the Marine Corps with different types of weapons. And one of the weapons that I carried was called a BAR. <laughs> And it was a Browning automatic rifle. And in those days, in a platoon, you only had people that had semi-automatic rifles. Today, everybody has an automatic rifle, you know, in the military, basically. And I'm talking about the foot soldiers and that. And so in those days, you'd have a platoon. And in a platoon, you would have uh, squads in that platoon. And you basically would have four, maybe five squads and each squad would only have one automatic rifle. So the guy that carried that automatic rifle, he had to uh, carry extra ammo, and then there were other people that carried extra ammo for the automatic rifle because it put out a lot of bullets. <laughs> it wasn't like we we had to learn how to stuff. And Timothy, you know, he had to do these same kind of things. He had to keep his mind clean. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because the two-edged sword had to come out of his mouth. It had to be sharp. <laughs> See? And so we have to know. We're not talking about sharp meaning cutting people. We're talking about coming against the enemy, stopping the enemy. Right? And th that kind of stuff. So Paul's telling him that uh, he said, No man that worth entangle himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who have chosen him as a soldier. And then in verse 5 he said, And if, any man, uh, if a man also strive for masteries, in other words, if you're striving to do something to achieve to a different level, yet he is not crowned except he strive lawfully. So whatever you do, you have to do it lawfully, and that means legally. See, legal according to the rules of engagement, we should say. See, we had the Geneva Convention and some uh, countries uh, obeyed it and some countries did not obey it. So anyway, so but still we, uh, you, if you do what's right, God will be with you to help you. Amen. Now verse 6 said, the husbandman that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. Well, that's a real uh, simple thing there. It's talking about, you know, if, if uh, you're the one that's out there laboring, you have to live what you're teaching. <laughs> you have to, that has to be coming out of your mouth. You have to be saying it. You have to be living it. It has to be your manner of life. If you're not living it, then you're living a lie. <laughs> and that's not going to get anything done because uh, people are eventually going to see that you're a fake and a false minister. And there was false teachers, false prophets, you know, false apostles uh, out there, you know, trying to do things. And so we need to know they're still here today. Mm -hmm. So whenever you're going to uh, do leadership, you... <clears throat> Uh, you have to make sure that you do it lawfully. In verse 6 it said, The husbandman that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. Again, you're, you're the one that partakes of the same thing. You have to live by the same thing. I remember uh, Brother Hagen 
uh, saying that he was talking to a minister one time. And the minister asked him, he says, uh, well, Brother Hagin, do you ever uh, get sick? And he said, well, no. He said, you know what I mean, sometimes you just don't feel really good. And he said, well, I've been done that sometimes, you know. He says, well, let me tell you what I do. And then he, Brother Hagin said he'd tell him all these different pills and different things that he took and uh, aspirins and whatever, you know. <laughs> you know, I guess he's taking drugs just like people do in Hollywood, you know, and doctors do sometimes to stay awake, you know. And uh, then he said to Brother Hagin, he said, what do you do? He said, well, I'll tell you what I do. <laughs> he said, I go by what the Word says. If I can't live by the Word, if I can't stay healthy by the Word, why should I be out there telling other people that they can be healthy by the Word? Mm -hmm. See, if I can't stay prosperous by the Word, how can I tell other people that they can be prosperous by the Word? See, and if I can't have a good life, you know, on earth, how can I tell other people they can have a good life on earth if they serve God? See, so uh, anyway... He basically let the guy know that he lived by the Word. He said, well, you know, uh, if, if something really happened, you know, and da-da-da-da-da, you know, he said, well, what would you do? You know, and he said, I'd double up on the Word. <laughs> I'd double up on my medicine. <laughs> the Word of God. Amen? So that's what we have to do. Now, verse 7, it says, Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. So, Paul's telling them, you know, think about what I'm saying here, consider it, and, and the Lord will give you understanding in everything that you're doing. He will help you. That's why Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to be our helper, our counselor, our guide. Amen. And so we have to learn in the Word of God how to listen to the Holy Spirit. I mean, the Holy Spirit, when He shares something with us, we can find it in the Word. We can always find it in the Word. If it's a wrong spirit that says something to us, it won't be in the Word. See? And so we need to know that, again, there's uh, angels of light, there's ministers that are teaching the wrong thing, giving you the wrong information. So listen to the Holy Spirit and let it be confirmed by the Word. Now verse 8, he said, Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. The main, main, main ministry of all the apostles when they went, uh, you know, as Jesus' apostles went out to the Jewish people and the apostle Paul when he went to the Gentiles, the main message was the resurrection. The resurrection. Without the resurrection, we can't have life. We can't have the life of God without the resurrection. And so, he said, Remember that Jesus Christ of the city of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. So he's saying his gospel was the gospel of the resurrection. And if you go through the book of Acts, you'll find out that it was over and over and over, everywhere they went, they were talking about the resurrection. Verse 9, he said, Wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even, uh, at, even unto bonds, being you know, bound, put in prison, jail, you know, and all that. <clears throat> but the Word of God is not bound. So even if they put Paul in jail, like in the Philippian jail, <laughs> you know, he's still praising God and mm -hmm. still doing what the Word of God tells him to do, and he comes out of the jail, right? See, so the Word of God will free you. Jesus said, you know, if you continue in my Word, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Mm -hmm. Amen. It'll make you free in every area of your life. Now verse 10, he goes on to say, Therefore I endure all things. So he's telling Timothy, you know, to endure. The, there, uh, as we began, you know, he said, But now I'm telling you that I endure all things. I'm over in uh, chapter 2. <laughs> right? Yeah. And I'm supposed to be in chapter 3. Well, <laughs> but anyway, let me let me just uh, finish up here and then I'll get back over into chapter 3. I don't know why I got over there. So he, uh, Paul's telling him the same thing, you know, endure all things, and he's telling him that he endures all things for the elect's sake. 
talking about the body of Christ, that they may also obtain salvation, which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Verse 11, it is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, in other words, we died with him, and uh, identification of his death, his burial, and his resurrection. See, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. Verse 12, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. And uh, when it uses the word suffer right there, the word suffer there really means to endure with God's help. To endure with God's help. So if we endure with God's help, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful and cannot deny himself. And then he says, Of these things, put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord, that they strive not after words to no profit, but the subverting of the hearers. Verse 15, I wanted to get to this and read it, and then I'm going to skip over to chapter 3 where I'm supposed to be. Now, it says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So what we need to do is we need to learn how to rightly divide the word of truth. I want to give you something really simple here that Dan Hagen taught us. And he said it's this simple whenever you want to understand Bible interpretation. Bible interpretation is very simple. Don't let it be complicated. If you find something in the Old Testament... Then find it in the Gospels and then find it in the Epistles and now you know it belongs to you. That's how simple Bible interpretation is. Now he said this. <laughs> he said sometimes people get in a big argument over certain things and this and that, you know. He said, but if you want to get in a big fight over it, he said, what you want to do is you want to find it three times in the Epistles. You find it three times in the Epistles, you know for sure that it belongs to you. Because the Bible says in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. So I wanted to just share that with you. It's so simple. Don't complicate interpretation. Uh, for instance, if we were uh, studying the subject of healing, in Isaiah 53, we have what we call the great redemptive chapter. And it talks about salvation, and it talks about healing, and deliverance, and it talks about uh, what all Jesus bore for us. Okay? Now, if we took that scripture and said, well, does that belong to the church? See? Or does it just belong to the Jewish people? Well, we come over to Matthew chapter 8, verse 16 and 17, and we see that Jesus is healing everybody. And, he's, and then it says that it might be, you know, brought out the fact that... Uh, Isaiah spoke this. This was what Isaiah spoke. Amen. And this was what belongs to us today. So he's presenting it to them today. Then we go all the way down to 1 Peter 2.24. And it says, By whose stripes ye were healed, talking to the church. That's an epistle from Peter, talking to the church. So we have it in Isaiah. We have it in the Gospel. Now we have it in Peter. Just wanted to give you... That real little, little simple little example, right? <laughs> See? Now, let me get where I'm supposed to be. Here in 2 Timothy chapter 3, Paul said, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Well, <laughs> we're there. <laughs> you know, perilous times have already come, haven't they? He said, For men shall be lovers of their own selves, uh, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, uh, false accusers, incontinuous, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. Now right there is where most of the church has just skipped over the power. <laughs> they have denied the power of God because they have denied the infilling of the Holy Ghost. Yes. See? And the Bible says, I mean, the first thing 
when we get over there into Acts chapter 1 and chapter 2, when the church uh, was birthed, we could say, right? The first thing that Jesus said to them is wait for the promise of the Father. Well, what was the promise of the Father? Well, the promise of the Father was that you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me and you know, we could say Modesto, Stanislaus County, California, United States, and around the world. See? And so we're going we're gonna to be witnesses because we have the power. Now, T.L. Osborne himself, one of the mightiest apostles that came out of America, you know, he said that he and his wife, Daisy, went uh, overseas to do the work of the ministry. Their first trips, they went over, he said, and we failed terribly. And they came back, and they got in contact with a man by the name of Charles Price. Charles Price was one of the great evangelists of that time. And when they got a hold of Charles Price, he began to train them and teach them how important it was to go into power of God with the power of the Holy Ghost and all the gifts of the Spirit to get the job done when you're on the mission field. See? And so, he said, the next time we went, he said, we were effectual. <laughs> and we got things done. And so they ended up, I mean, uh, 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 Teal and Daisy went to like 70 countries of the world. Now they've gone past 80 with his uh, daughter LaDonna has stepped into mom's place, you know, and they're going on. And they're in Russia. She's, I mean, it's amazing uh, how, what you can accomplish when you have the power of God. Now, by us having the power of God and being filled with the Holy Spirit, we took trips to Norway, went there nine times to Norway, and when we got into Norway, God immediately got us in contact with a man that owned the television station in Oslo. <laughs> hey, and from then on, we were on television every day for an hour or sometimes two hours. On television. Amen. Broadcasting Norway and you know, into Sweden and probably into Denmark. Uh, I'm sure it went into Denmark because Oslo is right there, pretty close to the ocean, and Denmark just right there across. You know, there's no mountains or anything to interfere, you know. And so, anyway, uh, we were able to accomplish a lot of things, and a lot of things were open to us because we were on television. And so we did ministry in, uh, around, all around Norway, around Oslo, and, and uh, then we went into Sweden, and then finally we went into England and Ireland, you know. Uh, but God just opened the doors for us to go and do the work of the ministry. You can see how you can accomplish things, but we had to listen to the Holy Spirit. I wasn't really good at that to begin with. Paulette was better at it. And I appreciate some of the things that she helped me to see and understand, you know, because uh, there was a prophecy that came over us before we got out to too much into the ministry. And the prophecy was from two different people, and it was exactly the same prophecy from two different people that didn't even know one another. And the prophecy was that I was the Word and she was the Spirit. Got that? And so she'd get things by the Spirit and, you know, and she'd get the Scripture, but she didn't know where the location was. See? And she'd say, well, where is that? <laughs> see? Well, she got it by the Spirit, see? And I knew where it was in the Bible. So as the two of us together, you know, we were able to get the job done. But what, what are we saying? We had to depend on one another, didn't we? Mm -hmm. See? You have to depend on the Holy Spirit. You have to depend on one another. You're not an island to yourself. Nobody has it all. Mm -hmm. You know? Only Jesus. <laughs> Jesus had it all. Mm -hmm. But nobody else has it all. See? Mm -hmm. So we all have to basically depend on one another. And so we're talking about uh, the value of detailed instructions that comes from the Holy Spirit. Paul's given all these instructions to Timothy. These instructions are coming right down to us. Yes. See, if we want to be a leader and help people and see people set free, then we're going to have to listen to the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Amen. So the people 
here, having a form of godliness, denying the power of, so from such turn away. So, uh, you know, I don't basically hang around with people like that. Uh, <clears throat> you know, if they don't believe in the Holy Ghost, that's their problem. You know, but I try to share with them, and I try to get anyone that I can filled with the Holy Ghost. God actually gave me a special anointing, actually, to help people get filled with the Holy Ghost. And we saw that real effectual when uh, we were in Ireland, especially. Uh, <clears throat> Paulette and Peggy were ministering to people for healing, and I was ministering to people getting them filled with the Holy Ghost. See? So they were kind of a team there, and I was uh, over here by myself doing this, and I had a guy helping me because I wanted him, whenever we left there, I wanted him to be able to continue doing what I was doing. See? I don't like... I don't think it's God's will for ministers to go someplace and be the big, uh, you know, whatever you want to call it, <laughs> and, uh, and then leave without, without training somebody to be there. That's one of the things that John G. Lake recognized when he went to Africa and different places, you know. Hey, the, the plague broke out over there, you know, and, and things happened. And he had a tremendous ministry showing the people that it was the power of the Holy Spirit, the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, in uh, Romans uh, 8 and 2, that kept him free from the plague. See? And the thing is, <laughs> uh, one time he had to come home, and so when he went back over there, the guy that he had trained, that was uh, an African, that was being trained under his ministry, he went back and he said, that guy was doing everything I was doing and more. So he said, they didn't need me anymore. So he, what does he do? He goes to another place and stirs up a fire. Mm -hmm. See what I'm saying? And so when you can get somebody steered up in another nation or another place, uh, just leave them with them. Let them go. See? And go on and steer another thing up. Mm -hmm. See? So Paul's looking for people that had that ability to go out and do that. Um... Uh, he says in verse 6 there, uh, talking about the people uh, denying the power, he said, For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women, laden with sins, and silly men too, you know, laden with sins, led away with divers lusts, ever learning, watch this, and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. So the reason people are not able to come to the knowledge of the truth it's simply because they don't have the teacher in them. Mm. Oh, well, I, if, you know, people will say, uh, in my denomination, we believe we have all the Holy Ghost there is simply because when we're born again, we have all the Holy Ghost there is. Well, the Bible teaches whenever uh, uh, Paul was over at Ephesus, he asked him, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? Now, why would Paul ask him a question like that? Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? See? And they said, we've not, we've not heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. He said, well, then were you baptized? And they said, under John's baptism. Well, they weren't even born again, found out. See? And then after that, he began to tell them, you know, that John was a forerunner to come and uh, represent Jesus, get the people ready for Jesus, right? So well, then they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And then Paul laid his hands on them and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen? Now we could back up and get more detail there, but you know, all I'm trying to do is cover the fact that people need the power of the Holy Ghost. So there was 12 of them there got filled with the Holy Ghost. And, you know, Peter himself was summoned to go to uh, Cornelius' house, didn't he? Mm -hmm. See? And when he got there, he asked them what they wanted and they said, well... An angel came and told Cornelius to send over there and get Peter. And told exactly where Peter was. And Brent asked him to come over there and present the word to him. So Peter presented the word to them. And the power of God fell. And the Holy Ghost fell on that bunch. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. Well, what happened? They got saved. They got filled with the Holy Ghost, didn't they? Mm -hmm. And then Peter said, well, you know, they could be baptized with water right now. See? Why, why can't they be baptized with water? They've received the Holy Ghost the same as we did. See? And so there Peter got the Gentiles, you know, 
Cornelius was a centurion for the Roman army, and he got them filled with the Holy Ghost. And there's a big controversy over in Jerusalem about Peter being hanging around with Gentiles, you know. And then when he told them the story, told them that God, you know, commissioned them all, okay, okay, well, then James finally stood up and said, well, okay, yeah, it's in the Scriptures. We can go to the Gentiles, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know. Well, you see what I'm saying? That it takes the Holy Spirit to break those things open and to cause the power of God to be released in different areas. Amen. Well, here he goes on to say, these people ever learning, never coming to the knowledge of the truth, well, they don't have the Holy Ghost. Then he, he identifies some of them. He said, now uh, Janes and Jambres withstood Moses. He said, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. Got that? But they shall uh, proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men as theirs also was. So they're saying that, you know, their false things that they're doing and what they're uh, trying to accomplish there, it's going to be manifest, it's going to be brought out. Manifest means brought out into the open so everybody can see it. See, when God uh, manifests, see, He manifests the gift of the Spirit. He brings them out so people can see it. See? There's manifestations and there's demonstrations of the Spirit. See? And so we need to understand that God can manifest through us, but He can demonstrate actually without us. Okay? Now, okay, so verse 9 it said, But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men as theirs also what? Verse 10. Thou hast fully known my doctrine. Now, Paul was the one who taught uh, Timothy, you know, and he said, Thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, that means Christian love, patience, that means being consistently the same way, and verse 11, persecution, in other words, what, how people came against him, afflictions, you know, how he'd been beaten, mistreated, which, come to, uh, which uh, came unto me in Antioch and Iconium at Lystra, where, what persecutions I endured. There's that word endured again. And that means he, he overcame it with the help of the Spirit of God. Mm -hmm. See? He walked right through it because he went all the way to the end of his life, all the way to Rome, where God said he's going to go. See? But, and one time, let me say this, one time he was stoned to death. Mm -hmm. And they got around him and God raised him up. See? Now, so he said, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all, the Lord delivered me. You got that? Mm -hmm. Out of them all, the Lord delivered me. So when we walk in the power, when we walk uh, with detailed instructions from the Holy Spirit, uh, we're going to walk right through the situation. Just like Jesus in his own hometown, they got so upset with him that they were going to throw him over the brow of the hill. Remember? That was in Nazareth, in his own hometown. See? What did he do? The Bible said he walked right through the crowd. This is the reason I tell people, follow Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> Don't get ahead of him. Don't get too far behind. Stay real close. Follow up right close behind Jesus. Why? Because when the crowd comes, you're going to walk right through the crowd with Jesus. Yes, Amen? Amen? Because He's going to show you exactly how to do it. How is He going to do that? By the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And if we went over to uh, uh, John 14, 15, 16, you know, we'd see that the Holy Spirit is seen here mainly to reveal Jesus and to reveal what Jesus has for us to do. Amen? Again, I don't want to give, uh, uh, go over there. I want to just keep moving. Verse 12, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So if we live a godly life, that means that there's going to be people that aren't going to like us because they like the devil and what the devil does. And so if the more you live closer to God, the more you live closer to truth, <laughs> you're going to find out the less people are going to want to hang around you. Mm -hmm. See? I tell people, I said, you know, when uh, uh, I noticed that whenever I was working and working and working to stay with truth and that, you know, uh, people started 
uh, you know, distances themselves from me. See? Well, I don't believe it like that, you know, like on the translations of the Bible. Well, you know, I, I'm not against my brethren that are in the translations of the Bible. I just don't use them, you know, because, uh, you know, they're not correct. Mm -hmm. If you take the NIV and the New American Standard, leaving out 60,000 words out of the original text, why do I want to read a text like that and call it the Holy Bible? It is not the Holy Bible. It is an unholy Bible. And, it, and the, the uh, foundational roots of that Bible is West Cotton Hort. We studied it. Paula and I studied it for five years. And we found where the source of those Bibles came from. See? And so we don't use those Bibles. Amen. Now, verse 13. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. Right? Deceiving and watch this, and being deceived. <laughs> They're deceiving and they're going to be deceived. Right? Verse 14. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned. Continue thou in the things that which thou hast learned. Well, Paul had taught Timothy. But before Paul got a hold of Timothy, his grandmother and his mother had taught him. See, and Paul voiced that whenever he was working with Timothy. See, he said, you know, you've been brought up by your grandmother, Lois. You know, uh, I think, that, well, anyway, you've been, you've been brought up by your grandmother and your mother, you know. And, you, and the thing is, you know the truth of the Scriptures. Now, Timothy's father was a Greek, meaning he wasn't born again. <laughs> His father wasn't born again. <laughs> so the Bible tells us, you know, Paul circumcised Timothy because he was dealing with Jewish people. And they weren't going to receive anything from Timothy simply because he wasn't circumcised. Mm -hmm. See? Well, the circumcision has no bearing and uncircumcision has no bearing. Paul taught on that in Galatians chapter 3. Mm -hmm. So, and 4. Now, but what we need to see here is what Paul is trying to bring out to Timothy is that uh, we have detailed instructions in the Word of God and if you stay with what you've been taught, you're not going to go into error. You're not going to be following the wrong people. You're not going to be going the wrong way. And you're going to be getting uh, God's uh, job done the way He wants it done. Mm -hmm. Amen? Now, so He said, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and has been assured of. In other words, you know for... Uh, you have assurance of the Word, right? And knowing of whom thou hast learned them. See, in other words, you've connected with me. I got it by revelation from Jesus Christ, so that's pretty close. <laughs> you know, he didn't get it from man. It was 14 years later before Paul went to talk to them about what revelation he got from the Lord by the Spirit. And there was conflicts because when he went to Jerusalem, they said there's many believers in Jerusalem. Listen to this. But they're all zealous for the law. Well, see, that's law and grace. That's a mixed doctrine. Believe me, in the Pentecostal ranks, and I've been in the Pentecostal ranks, they have a mixed doctrine of mixing law and grace. That's because they don't go by that simple interpretation of Scripture. See what I'm saying? Amen. They don't, they don't take the simple way they decide they're going to do something on their own. You know? And they isolate themselves. You know? Okay, we, we won't go on with that. Now, verse 15, it said, That from a child thou hast known... Here it is, right here. That from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Now, so Timothy, he was taught, he was brought up the right way. Amen? And so that's the reason uh, Paul nabbed him up and took him on the ministry with him and trained him up and qualified him and, and allowed him to be the pastor of the large churches that he would work with. Timothy actually pastored a couple of large churches. One of them, uh, Titus ended up taking over because Titus was more uh, fitted for that type of ministry. It's amazing. We, that's another thing that people need to understand. You know, the Bible tells us God set pastors. 
If God didn't set a pastor in a church, <laughs> then that pastor, he's not going to stay there in that church. He's not going to accomplish what God wants done in that church because God didn't set him. Somebody hired him or something. Well, anyway. Well, blah, 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 blah. Now, <laughs> and so from a child that has known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Our faith is in Him. And then he says in verse 16, all Scripture. How much Scripture? All. all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. Well, doctrine is correct teaching. We're talking about correct teaching here. In other words, the doctrine of the Lord would be the Gospel. <laughs> See, the Gospel of Christ. See? Uh, <clears throat> then it says for reproof. Reproof. That means censoring it. You're censoring what's uh, being said. You know, you don't judge people, but you can judge what they say. See what I'm saying? Like, uh, oh, well, uh, one person said, one minister said, that uh, there was a famous minister, I'll just say it that way, there was a famous minister, and that famous minister had great faith. I mean, he could, he had faith to do things that, and have miracles that nobody else was having. But somebody said, you can follow his faith, but not his doctrine. How about that? See? Now he had great faith to bring about miracles, but when he came over to do teaching, he wasn't a teacher. He wasn't called to be a teacher. See? And so he got off into false doctrine in his teaching. And so, again, people need to stay in their offices. There's five main offices. The apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, and the teacher. And they're all in operation today in the church. Every one of them. The apostle is still out there. Teal Osborne and uh, Letcher Summerall were modern day apostles. Uh, like I said, Teal and his daughter now are going to 80 countries of the world. Uh, uh, Letcher Summerall went to over 100 countries of the world. You know, if you can't call that an apostle, I don't know what you call an apostle. And they both had signs and miracles in their ministry because the apostle Paul talked about what it was that uh, rated him or uh, qualified him to be an apostle. And they all had those signs in their ministry. So, there you have those apostles, you know. Are there prophets today? Yes, there's prophets today, <laughs> you know. And I, I believe Paulette and I operate in a prophet's ministry. We do that diverse times interpretation. We operate to help people in uh, that ministry of bringing forth revelation. And we met several of them. Kim has these meetings over here, uh, you know, at the Golden Corral. If you want to come to those meetings uh, at the Golden Corral, he brings in ministers from everywhere. And some of them are great teachers. Some of them are great people in Revelation, and I know that they're standing in a prophet's office. You know, I've seen them and talked to them. See? So, we need to know, we just censor it, whether the person is proper or right. That's reproof. And then, he said, all scripture is given for correction. So, sometimes we have to be corrected. <laughs> if it's wrong, we have to correct it. See? And so, uh, Paulette and I were sharing some things, you know, with different ministers that you know, we saw some things, you know, and that, that we don't believe that's correct, you know. We're just sharing it with you. You decide what you want to do with it. We're not, you can't demand somebody else to do something. You know, I tried to help different people when I was in uh, ICFM. I was helping young ministers because I'd been in business and I had business sense and I knew about lawyers and accountants and how valuable it is to have them in your ministry to help you to stay uh you know, going the right way. Make sure you're not in opposition against the government at the same time doing the works of God. And people say, well, how can you do that? Well, just like Jesus said, you know, with the coin, they said, do we pay taxes to Caesar? And he said, show me the coin. And they showed him the coin and said, whose image and superscription is on this coin? And they said, Caesar. He said, well, render to Caesar's the things that are Caesar's and unto God the things that are God's. Well, you know, Jesus came right in the middle of the Roman occupation of his country and fired up a church and sent them around the world. Amen. See?
So it doesn't matter how much opposition there is out there. The church is greater than any opposition. As long as we have the power, as long as we do what the Scriptures tell us, see, because the Scriptures here are by inspiration of God. They came from God, direct from God, and they're profitable for doctrine, for reproof, censor, for correction, and then it says for instruction in righteousness. Instruction in righteousness. That means in right standing with God. Now, first church I came into when I, uh, you know, I uh, came out, out of the world. I was born again in 1951, but I wasn't living for God, <laughs> you know. <clears throat> but the first church I came into, you know, uh, when you got saved, they said, well, now you're just an old sinner saved by grace. <sighs> That's not the truth, folks. That's not the truth. The Bible says when you're born again, you're a new creature. All things are passed away. All things are, you know, gone. They're gone. As uh, far as the east is from the west, He removes our sins from us. We're not old sinners anymore. You know, we're new creatures in Christ Jesus. Right? Mm -hmm. And so we need to know that uh, in uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21, uh, that was 5.17, in 5.21, it said He became sin for us that we, uh, He might make us the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, right? So there you have the Scriptures that set us in right standing with God, right? Now, I want to finish this so we can uh, finish for today. Verse 17, and it said, and the man of God, uh, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Now, we're talking about the value of God's Word, and that it provides detailed instruction. And so right here we're seeing that the Scriptures are for uh, doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, for the purpose that the man of God or the woman of God may be perfect. Well, some people say, well, you can't be perfect. You know why they say that? Because in their perverted translations, it changes the word perfect to mature. Or to some other thing. Or leaves it out. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, but what God created on the inside of us is absolutely flawless, perfect. Amen. And the person on the inside of us cannot sin. First John tells us it can't, that person on the inside cannot sin. Where's the sin? The flesh. The flesh. And so, the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 12, we have to present our bodies to God and we have to renew our minds to the Word of God. Amen? So that we can please God in all areas of our life. Am I right? Mm -hmm. See? Here he said that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good work. Mm -hmm. So when we're out there doing the work of God, we're not going to make mistakes. We're not going to uh, uh, leave casualties by the wayside. See, because of our wrong doctrine or wrong teaching or wrong living. <laughs> See, we're going to walk the walk that we talk. Amen? Amen. We used to say it at Raymond, uh, do you walk the walk, you know? Uh, you need to know that you have to walk the same walk that you're talking, right? Mm -hmm. So are you walking the walk? <laughs> See, are you living it out? Mm -hmm. If you're not, well, then you're going to be a casualty yourself and you're going to create casualty. So, uh, we learn the right thing. We stay with the right thing. We listen to the Holy Spirit. He confirms it by the Word of God. And we can live by that. Amen? Amen. And we'll find out that God's Word is truly valuable to us for anything concerning our life or concerning helping other people, uh, you know, walk with the Lord. Get born again, number one. Get filled with the Holy Ghost, number two. Receive their healing if they need it. You know what I mean? And receive other things, whatever it is. Prosperity, you know. I know some people are anti-prosperity people. Well, they're against God. Mm -hmm. See, because uh, the Bible tells us that uh, well, let me just read uh, what John says. John, John was lying right there on Jesus' bosom, you know. Listen to what he said. In uh, 3 John 2, he said, Beloved, I wish above all things 
The word wish there is the same as the, as the prayer of supplication. It means an earnest, heartfelt prayer. I have an earnest, heartfelt prayer above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in hell even as thy soul prosper. What's your soul? Your mind, your will, and your emotion. You have to get your mind renewed to the Word of God so you can live in prosperity and you can live in hell. Mm -hmm. What is prosperity? Continued success and continued well-being. That's what prosperity is. That's the definition in the dictionary. Continued success and continued well-being. See? So it covers both what we're talking about there. Health and prosperity. Prosper and be in hell. Mm -hmm. Amen? Now, that's just one scripture. I can give you several of them. All the way through the Old Testament. And the Bible says, If you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So everything that was promised to Abraham and all the blessings that went on Abraham are all in the body of Christ because we're in Christ. Mm -hmm. yes. Amen. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll get back into this. And uh, I'm sure that uh, if you'll you know, listen, we spent 40-some years... And believe me, I've made some mistakes and so I'm trying to help you so you don't make the same mistakes as I did. And then uh, you can, you know, not leave any casualties behind. I'm sure I have, you know, I repent for doing it. But the thing is, I was ignorant and undone. And when I got knowledgeable and I got better at it, well, then I helped help people and got them in a better position to help other people. Amen. Amen.